Right? Uh, one of my favorite is the National Odd Shoe Exchange, where people who have perhaps one leg are able to buy a pair of shoes and then exchange the shoe that they can't use with somebody else uh, who has, say, a missing different leg. So these are matching markets, where in that case you could actually imagine introducing a price, but uh, you know, the internet is an odd place, and a lot of the time you don't introduce prices into these markets. But more traditionally, folks have looked at things like matching workers to firms. Right? So, uh, for those of you who are in the audience and PhD students, this will be near and dear to your heart at some point. Hopefully. You should leave here eventually. Um, matching children to schools. So I live in D.C., and in D.C. there's a school lottery that involves some element of preference solicitation uh, and choice on the parents' part, wherein uh, students who are entering, say, pre-K are allocated to schools via, say, some locality constraints, but also some other interesting issues such as, you know, charter schools versus public. Matching residents to hospitals, so if you were the kind of doctor who helped people, you would go through uh, a centralized matching process at the end of your MD, wherein you are going to be placed at a residency program. And this is a two-sided market where you actually tell the central system your preferences over, say, 12 or 13 or 14 different residency programs, and those residency programs have some capacity, and they also prefer you in some particular order, and then there's a magical matching. You all get an envelope in the mail, and it tells you where you're going to go for the next four years of your life. It's a real market. It's been around for quite a while. Matching patients to donors. So I won't talk about this in this talk, but like for those of you who know me, I do a lot of this kind of work in the healthcare space. Matching advertisements to viewers. So the example I like to give typically is when I'm giving this in a computer science room, I'll say something like, well, you know, matching advertisements to viewers paid for your nice new building, but hey, um, so it paid for the nice new read building, right? So this is a market wherein there might be constraints outside of price, such as I don't want to place two advertisements for competitors next to each other. And matching riders to rideshare drivers. This was an example that was shouted out from the crowd. That is also true, right? There might be a geographic answer. Yeah? So is our working definition of market anything that has this kind of bipartite bipart bipart structure? Uh, yeah, for this talk, yes. You can imagine more than two sides to a market. Yes. But I don't use the word platform market here, but a lot of the work that I've been looking at recently is motivated by platform markets, wherein we have a large platform where typically two, but sometimes more than two parties, for example, a seller and a buyer, and Amazon, uh, 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 the search friction basically is reduced by way of that platform. So for this talk, yes. So let's be a little more formal. Um, I said two sides. I said many to many matching. You know, agents can be matched to groups of other agents. So this is actually a problem uh, known in, in sort of the optimization literature. It's a combinatorial optimization problem known as bipartite, two sides of the graph, uh, B matching. Okay. So in traditional matching, any vertex can be matched uh, at most once. Right? B matching is an extension which says, hey, give it some graph with vertices and edges. Uh, We'll associate with every vertex some non-negative integer, b. And we're going to say that vertex i can be matched at most b of i times. So if b of i for, say, 3, so vertex 3, bi, b3 is equal to 2, then i can be matched 0 times, or 1 time, or 2 times, but not 3 times. So this clearly generalizes traditional matching in the sense that if I set b of i is equal to 1 for everything, then everything can be matched at most once. By part type, well, that means uh, that I'm going to split my vertex set into two, a u and a v, such that the only edges that can possibly exist have an endpoint in one and an endpoint in the other. So there's no edges between vertices on u, there's no edges between vertices on v. For example, sellers can't sell to other sellers in this sort of market. So here's an example. u has four vertices, v has three vertices. This is what's known as a complete bipartite graph in the sense that every possible edge exists. Uh, I've associated with vertices on the u side uh, an upper bound of 1, so I can match each of them once. And I've uh, associated with vertices on the v side an upper bound of 2, so I can match each of them at most twice. Uh, this is a legal v matching in this setting. That is clearly not a legal traditional matching in the sense that I've matched this vertex twice. So that's sort of the world-ish that we'll be working in. Uh, these are known to be solvable. If you add in a lower bound, so now I must match, for example, vertices on the V side exactly three times, then it becomes hard. Even for linear objectives, even for no uncertainty, 
And we're not going to be working in the linear objective space for this talk. We're going to assume that the value of a matching is uh, perhaps more or less than the sum of its parts. So in traditional matching, it's, it's like, uh, you know, I match some set of edges, and I just add up the points associated with the edges. Uh, edge 1 plus edge 2 plus edge 3, and I go on my merry way. In this setting, we're going to assume that there's maybe some diminishing marginal return of matching edges that look similar to other edges that you've matched already. So what are some examples of this? Well, uh, maybe I want to match workers to tasks in some sort of online labor market. So in this setting, for example, uh, imagine that you have a, a, a task up on whatever figure eight or crowdflower is called these days, and you want to label images, uh, uh, full stop. Then maybe you'll get diminishing marginal return for asking computer science professors repeatedly to label your images, and instead, you'll, instead of getting two computer science PhDs, uh, you're going to get one computer science PhD from the US, and the other one is going to be from the UK. And they're going to say, label this, this image of a car as a car and a, whatever the Brits call a car, or the, the hood of a car as a hood and a bonnet, right? Or a trunk and a boot. So you're going to get either diminishing marginal return for people who look similar. This will also allow us to encode things like soft constraints or hard constraints, such as synergies within that workforce that's sort of implied by what I just said, and maybe hard, hard constraints, such as quota systems where those are legal. I need exactly, or uh, I need at most uh, two Java developers. Well, I need zero Java developers. The world needs zero Java developers. <laughs> Another example is internet advertising. I did code in Java. Another example is internet advertising. So there are two sort of commonly known metrics in internet advertising, reach and frequency, actually advertising in general, reach and frequency, reach being the number, of, sort of the raw number of individuals that a particular advertisement hits. For example, if I hit the entire room with uh, I don't know, 30 of you or something like that, my reach is 30. Frequency is going to be the rate at which I hit an individual once per day or maybe the total number of times, right? And so you can imagine that there's diminishing marginal return, aka ad blindness, something like that. If I show you my advertisement, uh, you know, for the new Ford car, for the 40th time. So, um, any questions about the motivation there? Yes? What is the matching more than the sum of its parts? Uh, yeah, so these are known in sort of the traditional economic literature as uh, uh, complementarities and substitutes. So, if I have, for example, uh, uh, John is getting matched to items of clothing. Uh, then if I get matched to a left shoe, I value that at epsilon. And if I get matched to the right shoe, I value it as epsilon. But if I get matched to both of them, then I value it at 1. Right? We're actually not going to be addressing that sort of problem. This is something called supermodularity. Yeah? So very small question. The vector? Yeah. Do all the numbers have to be the same? No. Right, so you could have like different numbers for each group. Definitely. Yeah, yeah. So you can imagine this is like a budget constraint, if right, you will, right. on the advertising side. Yeah. Um, my budget is much smaller than whatever full professors are on this room. Right? And the problem is harder when the numbers are different. Uh, from a theoretical point of view, the answer to that is roughly no. Like, it yeah. hits hardness pretty much when you have like a lower bound of like three. Okay. You can imagine your favorite like set partition reduction or something. Um, from like a, an empirical point of view, that actually isn't clear to me either. So it's okay. interesting in yeah. competitive optimization problems. Yeah. If you have sort of more heterogeneity in your constraints or your coefficients, mm -hmm. a lot of the time what this does is it reduces the number of optimal solutions to like one, um, and then you don't have to deal with symmetry breaking. It's like, it's like the bane of combinatorial optimization. So in some sense, it, it, it's either easier or harder. It's unclear. Yeah. Great. So diversity in match markets. Our new goal is to provide good coverage over different classes of items or agents. So here's a concrete example, which I've motivated because we're all in this world. Uh, we have workers, which is what I call reviewers. You know, I'm uh, an SPC now in conferences, so I don't review anymore. Which is, yeah. Uh, we have workers. These are an AI reviewer one, AI reviewer two, HCI reviewer one, HCI reviewer two. So we have workers or vertices on one side of the market. They come with, say, some features attached to them. My specialty is AI. My specialty is HCI. The other side of the Market here is going to be firms. 
Okay, so I'm using workers and firms because it's a traditional way of doing this. Reviewers and papers. We have some AI papers that have floated in. We have some HCI papers that have floated in. And I'm going to say something like uh, reviewers need to be matched to exactly two papers, and papers need to be matched to exactly two reviewers. So the first question in a setting such as this is, does a feasible matching even exist? And the answer is clearly yes. For um, but if I said, you know, papers need five reviewers, then clearly the answer would be no. So let's just ignore that for now. Here I've drawn all the possible matchings between papers and reviewers. A maximum weighted matching, so let's associate with every edge some weight that's going to describe the sort of one-to-one -one goodness. So if AI reviewer number one reviews AI paper number one, uh, absent of any other outside effects like other reviews, how good would that review have been? Well, a maximum weighted matching will presumably do this sort of thing, right? So all the AI people go to the AI papers, all the HCI people go to the HCI papers. Now, in the context of reviewing, I'm sure we've all gone through this, uh, some problems might arise here, right? Like, it could be the case that the best reviewer for one paper is in Lab X at a particular university, and the second best reviewer is also in Lab X at that same university, and the third reviewer is also in Lab X. And so you can imagine as you pack in these reviews, Let's imagine there's a version of peer review that actually you know, works. Let's imagine as we pass in these reviews, we end up getting diminishing marginal return on the value of those reviews, because everybody's saying the exact same thing. So we might instead want to drop some of this sort of like individual economic efficiency and match, well, maybe the best AI reviewer goes to the best AI paper, but then we realize, well, packing in the second AI reviewer is less valuable to this AI paper, so we're going to bring in one of the HCI reviewers. So super simple example but just a concrete motivation for what we're trying to do. Cool. So, a question? Please interact. <laughs> okay. So, how do we define diversity? Uh, well, here's one example, and toward the end of the talk, I'll start pushing back against this one example. This is the, the first example that we came up with, in part because we can actually optimize over it, which is great. So, given K classes on one side of the market, for example, let's partition the set of CS type people into AI HCI systems in theory. I have my own issues with this. Obviously, if I recruit students, I don't know where I fit in here. Um, but let's say we do that. We have K is equal to four classes on one side of the market. We want the marginal gain of same class matches to decrease. Well, one way to do this is to, and the spoiler here is that we're just going to use what are called general monotone submodular functions. Here's one example. So focus on a single node, focus on a single, say, paper. Take all of the edges that are matched to that paper. Split all the edges into their constituent classes. So some set of classes come, or some set of uh, edges come from people in AI, some set of edges come from people in HCI, and so on. So focus just on the AI match ones. And then sum up all the values of those matchings, or edges, but wrap this square root around. So what's that going to do? Well, the square root is going to enforce, think about square root in your mind, right? It's, it's uh, uh, tapering off, right? It's going to enforce diminishing marginal return between same, same class matches. But then we're still going to have this linear combination of sort of cross-class utility. And then just do that whole thing across every possible uh, edge on the, or sorry, vertex on the left and every possible vertex on the right. And so, like I said, these are general definitions of, well, the questions on this so far? Great, these are, uh, this kind of function is generally captured by uh, some modularity. So who here has heard or not heard of some, uh, <laughs> yes, uh, who here has uh, not heard of some modularity? Some, okay, cool. So let's, let's spend some time on this talk. Okay, cool. Um, so let's say we have some, this is a very, very general class of functions. It captures, for example, uh, linear functions. Say we have some discrete set of n elements, 1, 2, up to n. These can be, for example, papers, okay? So paper 1, paper 2, paper 3, etc. And we define a function that takes any subset of these, so the empty set, the set of 1, the set of 1, 2, the set of 1, 3, and so on, all the way up to 1, 2, 3, up to n. Any subset maps it to the non-negative reals, 0, 0.1, 12, whatever. 
Well, we're going to call this function submodular if the following inequality holds. And this is a little bit to digest if you've not seen submodularity before, but roughly what it says is take any subset of these n elements, okay, call it, you know, it's a big subset, call it A. Take any subset of this big subset, call it B. And now pick an element that is not part of it either of these subsets, call it X. So we have B, a big subset, A, which is a subset of that subset, and an element X. This says that the marginal gain, if I add that element to my little set, is weakly greater than the marginal gain if I add that same element to my bigger subset. So if I have a little subset and I add a new element, my f goes up by more than if I have a strictly larger subset and I add that same x to it. Yeah? Can you explain this in like, uh, I guess, market, or like papers and... Uh, yeah, sure, sure, sure. So um, something's going to be some modular. So let's, actually, let's just ignore all the classes of people, all the people, okay? So we just have reviewers. Mm -hmm. I think it is probably a true statement that at some point, uh, adding more reviewers is actually going to give you diminishing margin of return on the review quality. Okay. So let's assume that that happens after the first review or something like that, um, which, you know, whatever. Um, what this says is, fix some subset of reviewers, say this whole room. There's, uh, you know, Jen Goldbeck out there somewhere. She's an element who's not part of any, any subset of this room right now. If I take the value that I get if the entire room reviews my paper, and add gen goal back to it, I get some marginal gain. Right? Now, for any subset of this room, so the left side, if I take just the value of the function for this and add gen goal back to it, then my marginal gain is larger than what I got if I added her to the entire set. Okay. So she's added more to the value that I got from a smaller bit of the room than she added to the value that I got from the bigger bit of the room. Because there's a diminishing return. Correct. Yeah. And then for every subset. So pick the right side, pick subsets to the right side, and so on. Pick like more than two. Right, right. Okay. And we're going to call it monotone if uh, the function generally gets bigger, smaller, I guess. No, bigger. Yeah. <laughs> uh, as as the subsets get bigger, so it goes off. Okay. So the function that I showed you on the last slide is indeed monotone and modular, And there are a bunch of nice properties, such as if I add two of these together, they're still monotone and modular. So all we need to know is that, say, square root is monotone and modular, and then if I add a bunch of square roots together, or if I put a lambda in front of one to regularize it, or whatever, all these properties are still valid, which is lovely. Well, definitely not in this talk. So this talk is going to focus on balancing diversity and efficiency in a principled way. Uh, we have some work on this in the offline case, which is to say where all the vertices are known a priori. This is not super common in the context of, of markets, right? So it is common in like reviewer matching in conferences. Everybody signs up, all the papers go in, you match. Most markets are actually what are called online. Advertising, crowdsourcing, dating, et cetera, where one or both sides of the market arrive in an online fashion. And then if we get to it, we'll start talking about a motivational application that some folks uh, and computer science I've been working on, uh, including Kat Schumann here in the back. Uh, it's like primarily her work, hiring a diverse cohort of workers. Okay. We'll take a multi-arm banded approach to doing this. And if we get to it, talk about some, some ongoing work here in Maryland. And I definitely won't get through that, but you should ask me questions as we move. Yep. When is like, diversity useful? Like if you're writing a new or if you're, you know, if you want to Uber, you're not going to want a Uber from like the next city. But That's right. Yeah. So, so this is obviously not always correct. So actually, that linear style function that you would want there, which maybe is minimizing, I don't know, waiting time, something like that, mm -hmm. that is also captured by monotonous modularity. Okay. So it is, it is true that if I, you notice that all of those less than signs have a little underlined. So if linear is basically equalities. If I add x, yeah. Okay. Gotcha. So you're but like yeah, so reviewing is one, crowdsourcing is one, you know, labeling images, for example, I want boots and I want trunk. Mm -hmm. If I get two or three or four trunks, maybe I get marginal return. Advertising is certainly one. 
uh, recommender systems in general, right, are going to be one of these. Go on Amazon and you get like 15 dishwashers advertised to you or whatever. Uh, I get to manage more of the return for the 16th dishwasher that you pack in there. Uh, and I guess you could make up your own example for dating. <laughs> Uh, and certainly in the case of workers. Great. So I might actually just fly through this. I think this might be um, a little too like theory CS for this audience, but we're going to be operating through the rest of this talk in sort of an online market. Okay, so we're going to assume that we have a bipartite graph, set of vertices u. u is going to be known entirely. Okay, so I know u. I can tell you u right now, but v is going to arrive one by one. Okay. It's going to happen over t time steps. So once per second for 24 times 60 times 60 seconds in a day, a vertex V is going to arrive. And it's going to be sampled independently from some distribution that I know. So say this is, again, advertising, and I'm Google or I'm Baidu, then I have a very good estimate of what the distribution of the eyeballs that are going to be flowing into my particular web properties is going to look like. I don't know who exactly is going to come in next, but I can draw with a reasonable amount of confidence independently from this known distribution that I've learned over the years. We'll make the assumption that a vertex V must be assigned immediately and irrevocably or rejected. So a vertex V arrives. It has some subset of potential edges with vertices on the U side, and we have to immediately choose one of these, or reject, and we can't revoke it, which is to say I can't show you, say, an advertisement or something like that, and then five seconds later say, you know, take back these, I'm going to show you a new one. Because then I, you know, I can't charge both advertisements. Well, I probably could charge both advertisements. And uh, for the theory portion of this talk, we'll assume that T is really big, and that there are a lot more vertices arriving. I guess these are kind of proxies, but a lot more vertices arriving than there are on the, uh, the U side of the market. Now, in traditional matching, one assumes that after this process is complete, the utility one gets is the sum of the utilities of every edge that you matched. Right? We're going to use our new hammer, the monotone submodular function. Now, negative just means it negative, monotonous modular function f over the edge of e. And again, this captures linearity. Now our goal is to design some <coughs> algorithm called ALG that's going to find a matching between the u side and the v side such that when I receive f points for that, so f on that matching, I'm going to maximize the expected value of that matching. So it's going to be a randomized algorithm. It's going to have to handle the randomness that comes along with sampling from a known distribution, and I want to maximize the expectation of the kind of points that I get. Okay. Cool. So, when you're designing online algorithms such as this, typically the way, or one good way to design these, is by thinking really hard offline to obtain some estimate as to how well you could do if you were omniscient, right? If you were like the god of matching. <laughs> and then use this offline solution, which you can't use, right? You don't know, this isn't, this isn't incorporating the actual series of people who arrive in your market. <clears throat> use that to guide your online matching algorithm. So think real hard offline, then online, use some information from this offline thinking to sort of reactively guide the way that you do matching on. And I'm going to skip going in depth into any of this, but like, there's a nice continuous relaxation of some modularity that we use to guide our offline solution to this. So remember, we know the distribution from which people are arriving. We know that this basically happens stochastically, so there's no adversarial sort of behavior here. So in some sense, that's going to make the problem easier. For those of you from the optimization world, optimizing things in the face of, say, some modularity as opposed to simple linearity results in some issues. Uh, and it's a discrete problem. So what we do is we relax this in a nice sort of principle continuous way. We solve an offline program 
which is basically going to tell us a distribution over how frequently an optimal omniscient algorithm would match particular edge types. So let's assume that we have omniscience. How frequently would we match a particular edge of type AI reviewer to AI paper, or this AI reviewer to this AI paper, or this HCI reviewer to this HCI paper, and so on? We get a nice distribution of that, okay? And it's a pretty simple math program to solve. We're going to maximize this nice continuous relaxation of our monophysal modular function, subject to what people will call matching constraints, which says that, well, we don't want to violate our matching constraints. We don't want to match people more than, say, B times, or we don't want to you know, match the same person, well, that's basically it, more than B times. We can write these down. So this is our online side B, this is our offline side U. We can say for everybody who arrives online, an expectation, an omniscient algorithm, would not match them more than the rate of their arrival. So I know the distribution from which these vertices are being drawn, and I know that any omniscient algorithm can't match any vertex type more than the number of times I would expect to see it in an expectation, right? Like, so this is basically saying this is a valid upper bound on omniscience. We have the same sort of constraint for the left side of the market, okay? So these vertices U exist offline, and in the basic case of just traditional matching, I can match it. Most, I can match them in expectation at most once. Right? That's just a matching constraint. So why did I say all this crazy stuff about uh, continuous relaxations? Well, it turns out that discrete optimization problems are hard. Um, if our monotism modular function is linear, we can actually solve this LP offline in polynomial time. If it's not, then we can solve it approximately. And this is approximately in sort of the theoretical computer science sense. We can solve it to within 1 minus 1 over e of opt in polynomial time. Okay. Phew. Okay. So do all this offline. I can write this whole thing down offline if I have access to my data, my distribution from which I'm drawing. What this does is it yields a probability distribution, x star, over these different edge types. Okay. So it's going to say uh, edge type AI reviewer to AI paper has, you know, weight 0.9, whereas edge type systems reviewer to AI paper has weight 0.2, something like that. Now I can use these probabilities to guide my online algorithm. Cool. So I said that this is a two-phase algorithm. One is to do things offline, the second is to do things online. So say we've solved that offline program to some sort of uh, close to optimal solution. We get our probability distribution x star, and now we can just do some simple sampling online. For example, when a vertex V arrives, we get a set of edges that we can match V to. V can match to vertex U1, vertex U2, or vertex U10. What we'll do is we'll sample from this set of neighbors for vertex V with some probability where a vertex, or sorry, an edge gets higher probability if it is more likely to be included in that omniscient offline solution. And it gets lower probability the more frequently I expect it to arrive. So what is this doing? It's saying, well, you know, the offline omniscient solution says this is a valuable edge, so let's try and match it. But if my rate is really, really high, if I expect a ton of these vertices to arrive online, then like I can probably not lose anything by waiting, right? Maybe I can wait for the next one to arrive. So the ones that will be matched the most are the ones that I don't expect to arrive very much, and that the omniscient offline solutions that are really valuable. So sample probabilistically. If that's a legal edge, which is to say, if the vertex U I'm matching to is still matchable, uh, choose it. Otherwise, don't. Mm -hmm. You can imagine other sorts of techniques, such as, well, you know, this is some sort of probability distribution. Maybe I just round it offline and then use that rounding online to select things. So maybe I'm going to round everything in X star uh, in some way to a to a binary vector that says when an edge comes in, if that rounded binary vector has a one, then use it. Otherwise, don't use it. And this is something called, well, draws on something from uh, the TCS literature called contention resolution, which is used basically for, for online matching. So in the context of time, I want to skip over some of the theory stuff on this. So we proved some stuff about these algorithms, right? Um, we've also started running some exploratory experiments 
in these settings. So I've been motivating a lot of this from advertising. You can also motivate it from online worker, uh, like crowdsourcing applications. So what are two common modular functions that are applicable to those application areas? One is budget additive. So I have a budget, right? I'm only going to get points until I run out of budget. I'm going to, uh, you know, let's say that I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an advertising platform. Well, I can keep showing advertisements after I've expended an advertiser's budget, but uh, he or she isn't going to pay me at that point. So I can actually represent this as a monotonous modular function, which basically says I get linear value back until I hit a cap of B the budget, and then I keep getting just that linear value up until B. Okay. All right, I guess in this case. So you can imagine this is just like a, a linear, 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 and then just flat. You can imagine weighted coverage of sets of elements. So this will actually dovetail nicely with the work I'll be talking about on hiring that Candace has been involved in. So we'll have some sort of, say, uh, function that basically does uh, uh, diminishing marginal return as I pack more and more elements into a set. And our framework is going to be in the B matching setting, and we're going to compare not against that offline optimal that was solved in P time, but we're going to say, hey, you know, uh, we're computer scientists, so we're not afraid of things that are solvable in NP, and that aren't solvable in P time, so we're actually going to solve to, to, to completion some crazy big offline math work. Um, and we'll compare against some state of the art methods from the theory world, uh, and it comes out pretty nicely, actually. So these are like, pretty naive, simple algorithms, and we chose them to be so, so we could prove stuff about them. And in practice, you would actually bring in some heuristics, right? You would bring in your favorite parameters to throw in your front of your favorite regularizers, and you would tweak that stuff. But even if you just use our simple, simple algorithms, these two in green, it turns out we can do really, really well against omniscience, which, hey, by the way, we're never going to be able to do anyway, because we're not the gods of matching. Yeah. Um, so that's cool. So I want to take a quick break here. The second part of the talk is going to be sort of a bit more applied. Um, are there any questions sort of about the motivation of using this sort of modular notion to do diversity promotion, uh, in that case, in online markets? Any questions about life? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so one of the assumptions that you made was that there's no adversarial things going on. Yeah. It's the people arriving stochastically. Yeah. In this setting, how likely do you think that assumption will hold? In hiring? Yeah. I see. Um and if if it doesn't hold, does your does your approach blow up or like No, so, so yeah, um <laughs> you know what I mean? and this is maybe like a longer theory conversation. Yeah, so yeah. In, in online matching there are a number of different sort of distributional like arrival rate assumptions you can make. Yeah. What I was talking about earlier is something called the known IID model. Known in that I know the distribution, IID in that they are independent and identically distributed, which is stochastic. There are other sorts of models, uh, such as the known adversarial distribution, which is to say I, I know the distribution, but there's some adversary who's able to choose the sequence by which vertices arrive. And then you could imagine taking that a step further, which is, well, hey, I don't even know the distribution, and there's some really mean person who's sending people in. And these are actually where the traditional online matching results are coming from, which is like, any old graph can come in, any edges can come in at any time, how well can you do? And so, unsurprisingly, in theory land, uh, it's hard to do well when you have an adversary and you have very little knowledge. But nicely, in the world of like large platform markets, uh, a lot of the time you, you don't really have an adversarial distribution, uh, and you do have a really good estimate of the distribution from which you're drawing. Now, we have some results, and they're not in this talk, we have some results in the right share setting where we have these adversarial distributions, um, which actually come into play when you have an adversary such as like time or nature. Um, and it turns out you can still prove some stuff, which is kind of nice. Yeah. Yes? Are there alternatives to the step modular approach, or is it inevitable in some sense that you have to consider that class of functions? It's definitely not inevitable. There's something called a determinantal point process, or a DPP, which is a nice complement to this sort of approach, especially in the recommender systems and advertising worlds. And that comes with its own issues, and it comes with its own sort of solutions. So one of these is like, why did I choose a particular semodular function? And we'll talk about that a bit moving forward. The DPP is a bit more interpretable than that. Um, uh, I won't go into depth what that is. Uh, you can actually do some nice sort of like sampling things with DPPs. 
but it's going to rely on like an enormous amount of data to be able to estimate the reasonable parameters for it. So basically, DPPs aren't going to be very useful unless you're like literally Google. Um, yeah. uh, but you can also imagine, so these are both soft constraints and that I've pushed them both into the objective. One could imagine trying to futz with quotas as well, hard constraints, right? So for example, in advertising, there's a, a notion of fairness, but you can also view it as a notion of diversity, which can be uh, implemented uh, via what's called a smoothness constraint, which is to say that if I have, say, a campaign that hits eyeballs over multiple weeks, I want the uh, impressions that I get on week A to be within a bound of, say, 0.9 and 1.1 of the impressions that came from the week before that. And I can actually define this over multiple advertisers or multiple eyeballs as well for some form of diversity. And so that's a bit more of like a hard constraint. Other questions? Cool. So let's keep our Symmodular hats on. But, uh, you know, I always do. I to get off at this point. Um, <laughs> sorry. It's already been a long day. Um, <laughs> let's move into hiring. Okay? So imagine we're a company and we're hiring a team of workers on a large pool of activities. Cool. What do we want? And I will also note that all of the artwork in this part of the slides is from Candice, who is an amazing artist. <laughs> What do we want? We want high user worker quality, right? Obviously. We want good interplay between the workers. We might have some constraints. For example, I might not be able to interview every person 10 times. I might not be able to interview, in fact, in person, every single person full stop. And clearly, I have uncertainty over individual quality. So this could be I have uncertainty over how good of a Java developer you are but I can hit you with these 30 minute interviews and ask you questions from whatever that guy's name is, Block. I think I saw a pizza head popping in. Is that a pizza head? <laughs> yeah, so I have uncertainty over individual quality as well. So for the sake of this talk, and we have some recent work appearing at NeurIPS in a month or two that generalizes this substantially, but for the sake of this talk, assume we have two ways of gathering information. One is to do a resume screen. So this is motivated in the context initially of a CS graduate admissions, where we have a homegrown system for doing basically what amounts to resume screening, right, application screening. We can also do in-person interviews. So in some sense, this is a cheap but less informative counter to the more expensive but more informative, say, in-person interview, Skype interview, programming, you know, take home, whatever. So that's the setting. We have two levers we can pull for each applicant, maybe multiple times, but they're going to cost us some amount of, uh, of, of dollars, time, or something. And we have a budget. So the key question is, how should a company allocate its limited interviewing resources to select the best cohort, say, of up to K employees, from a large set of job applicants? But another way, how should that company allocate, in this case, again, we have more general versions of this, but how should that company allocate cheap but noisy resume screenings and expansive but in-depth in-person interviews such that budget constraints are paid attention to and we can uh, maybe maximize this monotonous modular function which says, you know, my 10th Java developer, which I will continue to pick on, my 10th Java developer is worth less than my 9th is worth less than my 8th and so on. So So our high-level approach to doing this is to use what's called the multi arm bandit paradigm. Have people heard about bandits, people? What's up here? Uh, <laughs> I wish, man. <laughs> so think you're a mafia, no? Um, <laughs> so the paradigm of multi arm bandits basically says uh, it's, it's motivated initially from, from, uh, from slot machines. So these are known as the multi arm bandits because back in the day before you had buttons, uh, you had big arms that you would pull. And the idea was that if we have a bunch of slot machines in a row, say 10 of them, each of these is going to reward you stochastically when you pull an arm. So you spend some budget, you put your coin in, you pull the arm, and you get some draw from a distribution. 0, 0, 10, 0, 0, 100, etc. And if you were to optimally play your 10 uh, armed bandits, well, first of all, you'd probably not do it, period. But if you were to optimally play, which is to say you would maximize your expected returns, you would find the bandit that has the highest expected value, and you would just do it forever. So that's where the name comes from. 
This has applications all over the place when it comes to things like, well, just learning about stuff that you can only noisily sample at some cost. Yep. All right, let's boot this thing back on. So, put your modular hats back on. Put your hiring hats back on. Now you're wearing two hats. It's great. We're going to model this as a multi organic problem in what's called the combinatorial pure exploration setting. Okay, so we have a set of 10, say, these slot machines. We're going to represent each slot machine as a random variable with an unknown mean. Okay, so slot machine 1 is going to be represented as x1, and I can sample from x1, right? I can sample from x1, I get like a noisy signal as to its true mean. Now if I sample an infinite number of times, right, I have a pretty good empirical estimate as to its mean. But I've spent a lot of coins, right? I've set, spent an infinite number of coins to learn what the true mean of this random variable is. So the core problem of multi-arm bandits is, is one of how do I spend my budget pulling arms such that I learn enough about each of these random variables to do a thing. Sometimes that thing is to identify the arm that has the highest mean with some probability. In our setting, that's not exactly what we want, right? What we would want ideally is to know the true utility, say everyone's Java programming skills, we would want to know the true utility for everyone, and then once we've gotten rid of all that uncertainty, we want to optimize, maybe we want to find the cohort of k people that maximize our monotone submodular function. So it's a little different than the traditional multi arm bandit setting. Indeed, it's something called the combinatorial or pure exploration set. Whew, that's a lot of words. So what this says basically is, I'm going to spend some time pulling arms, and then once I've spent my time pulling arms, maybe that's a function of budget. I don't care how much, how much I lost, I don't care if I, you know, used all of my sampling on really bad arms, as long as I know enough at the end to maximize the function. So I'm going to do all my sampling early on, and then after that sampling ends, I'm going to choose some subset of arms at the end. So why am I going into this? Well, we can actually view every applicant as an, as an arm. Well, I should not drink out of anything, so um, I'll talk to you. Uh, every applicant has an arm. Okay. We have an uncertainty over the true value of that individual arm. Right? An application comes in, says, you know, I can program in Java and Python. Maybe that gives me a reasonable prior that that person can program in Java and Python better than like my mom, but not that much better. So I have to start sampling from that arm to learn more. And I do this by pulling arms at some cost to gain information. Okay. So we have a set of applicants. We can pull arms. Once we've pulled a bunch of arms, our goal is to maximize some objective over some cohort of arms. So I'm going to pick some set of k arms, and I will realize not their empirical means, but I will realize whatever that function is on their true means. Okay, so if I think you're really good at Java, but instead you're like a really good barista and you're really good at brewing Java, uh, then I'm not going to get points for you. Pure exploration, like I said, we pull all the arms first, and then we think about selecting the best set. We only care about how much effort it takes to get to that best cohort. So either it's the budget, or we're going to say with 95% probability, I want to get you know within some bound of the, the pack approach. Those of you who are working So let's set up the model. We build on some recent work from the machine learning theory world. Uh, where we're interested in selecting a subset of arms with some sort of structure. In our case, it's going to be some cardinality constraint up, up to size k. We look at the fixed confidence, which is this with some probability setting, and the fixed budget setting, which is I have enough you know, money to fly a thousand people out. Our generalization to this classic model is that we now have these two ways, and in fact, Candace has a paper coming out of NeurIPS in a couple months that has uh, a lot of ways, two ways to gather information about an arms utility. We have the weak pole which has some, this is like a traditional arm pull. We spend one token, and we get one amount of information. And we have a strong pull, where we spend more than one token, and we get more than one amount of information. So the direct proxies there are a resume screen, and a Skype interview, or a flyout, or a graduate interview, something like that. So, our theory so far is only for the linear case, but the experiments I'll be talking about, which is sort of more important for this style of talk, uh, are in the submodular objective case. So think back to that you know, sum of square roots thing that we were talking about earlier. So we present an algorithm that uh, chooses uh, like who to pull in this new model with some theoretical guarantees. 
So let's walk through what that looks like. Well, when I get an applicant, I have to do something to know something about that applicant. So for every one of the applicants that I get, I do some sort of very weak arm point. You know, I look over your resume, maybe I screen you if you didn't have three recommendation letters, something like that. So now I have a really, really weak estimate as to everyone's, say, true. I have a really weak empirical mean for everyone. Now repeat until confidence, big, you know, fuzzy confident around there. We have a lot of theory here. So repeat until, you know, with 95% chance, I'm within blah, a box. Ask some oracle for the best set of arms. Now do this twice. Okay, so I have empirical means for all the arms, and I have error bars around every one of these empirical means. I'm going to ask the oracle the following two questions. Assume every arm's true mean is optimistically the top of their error bar. Okay, so everyone just gets bumped up to the top of their error bar. Now assuming that, pick the top K. Now be a pessimist and assume everybody's true utility is actually the bottom of their error bar. Now pick the top K of them. So I have these two sets, sort of the optimal cohort in the optimistic case and the optimal cohort in the pessimistic case. If they're the same, call it quits. Which is to say, if I have K arms floating around up here, such that their error bars are so far removed from everyone else's error bars, then call it quits. I'm pretty confident these guys are good. Otherwise, take the set of arms that are in one but not both of those sets. So either they're in the best or they're in the worst, but they're not in both. This is called the symmetric difference. Choose the one you're most uncertain about and just probably with super bowl. And I'll repeat that until you're done. So we have some theory. Right, so, Stare, yeah, questions here? So we have some theory, which is scary. Um, <laughs> But we extend the results due to Chen and all to the case of basically arm poles cost you J and give you S. Okay, so we have traditional multi arm bandit poles where you have cost of one, gain of one, and now you can play around with cost of S, gain of J. Other way, cost of J, gain of S. We also give some results for general probabilistic pulling policies such as, well, you can do like strong poles only, right? So with probability one, do a strong pull, or with probability zero, do a strong pull. So that's like traditional multi arm bandits, and then everything in between. And we get some initial results relating swap to other algorithms as one does to get things published. The results are only for the linear case. So the monotonous and modular case here is still open. Cool. Uh, so questions on the theory behind that. And I now want to talk about uh, an ongoing uh, sort of real data experiment. So here is an uh, is it arm of type of applicants or an individual Yeah, so the type of applicant would be more in the contextual bandit setting. This is an actual applicant. An individual. So if you have a thousand people who have applied, you have one arm attached to each of those applicants. Yeah, some work that we're working on now is actually attaching a context vector to the arms, which is a, sort of a strict generalization of this traditional place, uh, uh, multi arm setting. Um, and then you would have more of like a type. Cool. So our initial motivation is incorporating diversity into real world hiring processes. Uh, well, in our real world, that's just graduate admissions. Um, so we used some actual admissions data. This is IRB approved. We're not actually making decisions. We're not actually making decisions. <laughs> but again, we're not actually making decisions. <laughs> so using real world data from the University of Maryland's Department of Computer Science to run experiments uh, using SWAP to simulate admissions of cohorts of, of students. And the, I'll just try and speed up a little bit, but the algorithm that we're going to be using is, uh, so the objective we're going to be using is actually the same to start with as that objective I showed you earlier. So we have types of candidates, and actually in the CS admission system, you have basically three types you're allowed to say. I'm, you know, I apply to AI and comp by on theory. So we actually have types. Or you could be from a particular region of origin, or in our system, up until I think two years ago, you could be one of two genders. Um, we're gonna do the same sort of sum over the classes, square root of the utility of the people in that class. Cool. That's our world. Okay, so this is actually a pretty tough optimization problem, but that's our work. So in our setting, you can run things like region or gender, and you can run things like applicant interest, so say I am and so. So our graduate admissions experiment setup, which 
does incorporate bias into the reviews. This is an experiment just as like a proof of concept. We trained a classifier on past emissions decision data. So basically in the past, we had reviewers rate every applicant numerically on a score between negative two and positive two. We also get an actual emissions decision. Okay. So multiple reviewers actually go in and they rate every candidate on a variety of dimensions, but they also give one final numerical score and then somebody actually gets accepted or rejected. And we end up looking at the application in its entirety. So things like the statement of purpose, which is scanned in because it's coming from like the moon or whatever, and so you do OCR on it. Uh, and you can do your favorite natural language processing style feature engineering, so word counts, LDA, and so on. Do the same thing for letters of rec. We have numeric data, of course. And then uh, we went through some of the literature that says, hey, you know, how do we interpret things like recommendation letters, uh, and actually implemented some feature engineering based off of that. So there are these notions of things like rhinestone words and ability words and so on. So for every applicant, now we get some sort of feature vector. And you can train your favorite machine learning based classifier to try and predict what we, the biased admissions committee, would have scored you as were you some set of features, and the decision that would have been made. Okay. So this is just so we can simulate results as to what a committee could have done. Again, we are not making decisions. So we used our classifier, we ran simulations of swap, diversifying for different sets of attributes. So again, at the time, we only had a self-reported binary gender of male female. I think this has changed. We also have region of origin, and so on. And then we can compare SWAP's results with the results of past admissions decisions. So actually on some of these papers, our graduate admissions director is like, he's a co-author on the papers, uh, and he's like very intimately involved in this kind of stuff, so we can actually ask him. So behind the scenes we call it the Jeff Oracle, which is what would Jeff have done. Um, <laughs> so we can compare that with past admissions decisions, which is clearly not a proxy for utilitarian matches. The Jeff Oracle, for example, would never have accepted the top 100 students if they were all AI people, right? He's gonna try and do some diversification on his own. However, we can compare against a simulated utilitarian matching, right? Remember that we have these review scores for every single applicant, so we can actually just ask, hey, what's the top one? Some caveats, they're not policy recommendations yet. I would love to have feedback on this. So issues, of course, we are learning what a committee would have done, right? This is going to give you a biased ranking. <clears throat> Interestingly, so we have, especially in the hiring context, like a resume screen versus a Skype interview versus a programming test versus a flyout, these are all going to give you, in some sense, information gained from different distributions. Right? So our model doesn't quite capture that yet. It just talks about the strength of a draw from a particular distribution. Uh, Comparing against reality is a little, you know, interesting because there are soft operational constraints. For example, you know, if the CS department comes into a lot of money, they might hire more students, that kind of thing. Obviously, we can't measure the true utility of a student, and we're just starting to uh, we're starting uh, to apply for a longitudinal study uh, that. Well, no, I guess we actually have some code in for this. Yeah, um, yeah. So Candace has actually done some code for this with the graduate uh, education school. Um, we're just starting a longitudinal study that tracks student success over time to try and get a better measure of this. Okay. So I don't want to actually accept students who look good right now, I want to accept students that are going to really sort of thrive in the, in the program, which is to say 5, 10, 15, 20 years down the line, how well do they do? Okay. So clearly there are some caveats here. But, if you run this on that real data, you get some interesting results that pop out. And I won't spend too much time going over the actual numerical details here, but the take home is basically, you can rearrange who you're admitting such that you can increase, under a variety of these sort of different diversity style objectives, you can increase diversity substantially at essentially a very low cost to sort of what the, the, the matching world would call economic efficiency, but sort of the top K best fit. Okay. And some behavior that you would expect pops out of this, right? So for example, these are from I think 2015 or 2016 in CS. Uh, there's clearly a bias for from, from North America. Some of that might be right, some of that might be wrong. And when you start diversifying over, say, region of origin, well, exactly what you would think happens, happens. But there's going to be this endogenous trade-off between individual applicant strengths across those clusters as well. So it's not just like a, you know, a quota-based system for doing this. And I'll leave with some ongoing work. I think I have four to five minutes left if we reduce my pizza. I talk by a pizza break. So, I should say 2017. 
we ran this during, I think, the 2017 PhD hiring season. Um, and this was, I think, on like six or seven or eight different students. Uh, we had Jeff actually call out and interview people that didn't go into the actual um, scoring, though, that was, a, that was a part of our graduate admissions data set. So there was just a discussion. And we also did a uh, small-scale survey of past committee members to try and estimate things like S and J. So J, I think, was six times for uh, a Skype interview cost six times as much as like a resume screen. So one of the work that we're really thinking about now, which is like, you know, how do I pick a submodular function? How do I actually do this sort of diversity promotion correctly? Right? I, I picked this somewhat arbitrary sum over square roots function, and in part that's because we can optimize over it. But there's this whole world out there of people doing preference elicitation, judgment elicitation, preference aggregation, and judgment aggregation which would say maybe we should ask policymakers exactly what they want in a way that they can understand and then develop a system that aggregates those wants into an objective function for the actual system here. So we can try to learn, in this case, some sort of monotonous modular function that best reflects the collective beliefs of the set of policymakers. And we have some initial work in sort of a different setting, uh, kidney exchange, that's doing some of this, so I'd like to sort of plan some of that to hiring. And then also we came into this problem of, you know, how should we partition? Should AI and HCI be different? No, of course not. So how can we learn these partitioning? And then finally, detecting bias in application materials is interesting. So the second ongoing work is in the context of tiered hiring. So here it's a generalization in some sense of the paper that I was just talking about, where we're going to derive a system that will progressively sort of whittle down the set of applicants to the final set that you need. So again, put on your large tech company hat. You have a million applicants. You have enough budget to do 10,000 phone screens. You have enough budget to do 1,000 flyouts. You have enough budget to hire 100 people. How do we subselect through those applicants under the assumption that the value of later interviews gives you more information but costs more? So we start with S equals 1, J equals 1, and as we move up this pyramid, we whittle folks down, but also we're spending more to learn. So this is roughly an extension of that spot model to both the pack and fixed budget settings. And we ran some experiments again on that same data set and found that, you know, this star here is the, the, the Jeff Oracle, the actual, the actual decisions that Marilyn made, and it turns out for less or about the same cost, you can beat top K, you can beat diversity over gender, you can beat diversity over region versus what we actually did. That's cool. So our CS department obviously has like a two-stage plan, right? So we, uh, I guess, do some resume screens in the, the second stage. Finally, we have some ongoing work that looks at group fairness in the band of hiring setting. So this is under review at a conference. Act like I didn't put that there. Um, and we're incorporating some notions of group fairness into, uh, uh, in this case, the contextual knockdown identity setting. Okay. So here we're going to have some settings such as, uh, say we have a set of arms and we partition them into two groups based on a protected attribute. What sort of guarantees can we say such that, you know, assuming that these two groups have the same average utility, but maybe one of these groups, the signal we're getting is maybe biased by something from society or biased for some other, other reason. What sort of guarantees can we make about polling policies and about the kind of outcome that pops out of this? So we're incorporating the group fairness technique from machine learning into this, into this world. And finally, Candace is working with, uh, I guess now she's an undergraduate, uh, on a system called We Predict that looks at detecting bias in application materials. Cool. So some open problems. I didn't talk about the offline case. In the online case, our theory could be a lot better. But in the diverse cohort selection case, incorporating fairness at every stage of interviewing with multiple arm pool types, and this is for a general notion of fairness, so a lot of people will apply with fairness versus bias, are they the same, are they different? Uh, incorporating notions of debiasing or of fairness at every stage of interviewing with multiple arm types would be great. And so I will leave it 